Call me Peter. <laughs> One day, some years ago, never mind how long exactly, I was attending to the routine tasks of spacecraft engineering when I thought I would look into the question of why is it that we still don't have cities in space? Now, that might seem an odd thing to do, uh, but my mother and my father both were civil engineers, and uh, I watched a lot of Star Trek. So, there you go. <laughs> now, we do have the space station, the International Space Station. But this is not a city in space. This is a very sophisticated base for a, sm a small number of six astronauts to do science in zero G. What I'm talking about is more like this. It's large, it's comfortable, it's safe. The whole structure spins, so you have gravity. And you could live there for years, decades, your entire life if you wanted to. Forty years ago, when this was first proposed, the scientists and engineers reckoned that it could be built with existing materials and methods. But the cost would be extremely high, much higher than the Apollo program, which had just been cancelled. And if you went to a um, reputable spacecraft engineer today, and you asked, they would probably say that it's not affordable now. Uh, not now, not in the next decades, maybe never. And that is the cage in which this particular possibility sits. To be built, it would have to be done with radical innovation. And radical innovators are always few in number. And there's a good reason for that, rooted in natural selection. It's absolutely right for the vast majority of us to like the status quo. Because without that, there might be risky change, there might be chaos, societies might fall apart. But it's equally right that there be a small number of people who dislike the status quo for no better reason than that it's the status quo. And Carl Sagan um, wrote it this way. Long summers, mild winters, rich harvests, plentiful game. None of them lasts forever. Your own life or your bands or even your species might be owed to a restless few drawn by a craving they can hardly articulate or understand to undiscovered lands and new worlds. And it's only after the radical innovation is done that the rest of us in the status quo can understand its advantages and disadvantages, and, and can decide how we feel about it. And then if it passes that test, we can naturally weave it into the status quo. And we've also seen an enormous concentration of wealth, more concentration than since the Gilded Age over 100 years ago. And it's this astonishing concentration of both wealth and technical capability that is empowering radical innovators to do what 40 years ago was undoable. Now, I'd like to give you four examples of the radical innovation that's underway already to make cities in space possible. The first one is rockets. Today, it costs $75 million to launch an astronaut to the space station. Now, not to get too profound, but if that was going to be the cost of getting people into space, there's not going to be a lot of people in space. The obvious solution to this, um, well, the obvious solution to this is look at what we do uh, in other fields. So, for example, if you threw away the airplane after each flight, well, we wouldn't have much of an airline industry either. So the obvious thing to do is to reuse the entire launch vehicle. And 40 years ago, this was the part answer to that um, to that problem. But it didn't turn out to save any money at all. However, with that experience behind us and in the system, um, Elon Musk, any Elon Musk fan people here, by the way? Oh, just a few, okay. Um, Elon Musk and SpaceX 
design this rocket, which can recover its first stage, not the whole rocket, but a, a big chunk of it, and reuse it. And Jeff Bezos with um, Blue Origin uh, ha is not far behind with uh, suborbital rockets that are also reusable. So you can see how the interconnection of concentrated wealth and radical innovation is making things possible that weren't possible before. Now, this, a second example is, has to do with materials. It's going to take somewhere between 100 metric tons and 1,000 metric tons per person to build the city in space. Now, that's like 20 to 200 elephants, for those of you who measure mass in elephants. <laughs> now, we could launch all this from the ground, but that would make that launch problem I just talked about even more complex and maybe impossible. Fortunately, we can get all the material we need from space. Now, people say that space is empty. And, well, that's almost the definition of the word space. But it's more useful to think of it as big. In fact, so big that even big things can be lost in it. So, for example, if, I, if this dot represents the sun, and if that was the size of the sun, if we were looking at it, then we wouldn't even be able to see the planets or most of the planets. But if I put, let's say, blue dots on all the planets and then colored dots on all the other objects that we found in um, the solar system, this is what it would look like. Now, the red and yellow dots are near-Earth objects that come close to the Earth. There's 18,000 discovered so far, and there's enough material there to sustain 10 billion people. And if you add all the material in green, which is the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, there's another million times more material there. And of course, there's not just material, but solar energy. Um, there is vast amounts available from the sun and lots of space to put up solar arrays. So we can get most, you can get all the material we need and the energy that we need to process that material from space. And again, there are small groups of radical innovators, um, Deep Space Industries is one of them, funded by wealthy individuals that are making headway in this area. So it's quite possible that in the next few years we'll have both affordable access to space for people and a large amount of material available uh, in space. The next example has to do with how do you build the station? Now, the International Space Station, for example, costs uh, tens of billions of dollars to build, and that's not even including launch cost. So, now, albeit that is a very complex scientific base, but how are we going to build an entire city? And again, if you ask a reputable spacecraft engineer, they will tell you something like, space is hard. Well, and they're not wrong. But designing anything big and complicated and that's really new is hard. So designing a ship, a car, an airplane, uh, tall buildings, uh, these, are, these are hard to do. Um, designing this telephone is hard. But when we build space stations, we design everything from scratch. When we buy a telephone, well, they make millions of these per month. That's what makes them affordable. So designing a space station from scratch or designing a space city from scratch would be like before you move into your apartment, instead of just going out to a shop and buying the, the uh, appliances and the furniture, instead you commissioned a large engineering team and you designed all new stove and refrigerator and electrical system and plumbing and all the rest of it. Uh, well, that would be... And then you did it again if you ever moved to a different apartment. You could see how that could get expensive. Now, this idea... So therefore, we need to look at using machinery and uh, products that were developed and mass-produced on Earth to build the city in space. And that has deep implications on how you build a city. 
So one, for one thing, you have to start with a construction site that is Earth-like. So it has to be spinning to provide gravity. It has to have an atmosphere. And it has to have protection from radiation. But beyond that, you also need people. Because that's how the equipment was designed to be used, is by people. And that turns out to be a good fit, because the whole purpose of a city in space is to have people in it. Now, when I mention this to my status quo spacecraft engineer uh, friends, their heads figuratively explode. So the next question has to do with um, how can we afford to maintain the city in space? Uh, for example, the International Space Station costs tens of, well, hundreds of billions, oh, sorry, hundreds of millions of dollars per year to just maintain with consumables and, and uh, equipment. So how are we going to maintain an entire city? And the answer to this is um, that we have to think big, not small. So let me start with this. Obviously, the more people you have, the bigger this, the city has to be, and the more expensive it's going to be to build. So, but there's going to be an upper limit to how much money investors would be actually willing to spend to build the city. So there's an upper limit to the number of people that you can have in the city. So that's easy. When we look at annual cost of uh, running it, it's a little bit more complex. Because of the way that the city is built. It's different than any other space station ever built because it has access to resources, it has access to energy, it has people, which means it has an internal economy. It has exports and imports, it has local production and consumption, things like, you know, electricians and that sort of thing. Um, and um, it's got savings. Um, so, it has its own ability to do things. Now, if you just extrapolate this and say, well, let's start by having millions of people in space, let's just, if, we, if we take that case, well, they would be completely independent. So they would not need to buy anything from Earth to sustain themselves. Now, maybe they would want to, but they don't need to. So the effective annual maintenance would be zero. As you consider smaller and smaller cities, they are less self-sufficient. So they need to import more, even though they have got fewer people. And as a result, the cost per person goes up of annual maintenance. At some point, the cost is so high that the person, there's nothing the person could do to earn the money they need to pay for the supplies they're getting each month. And that gives us a lower limit to the number of people. And in this gap, is then where the population of the, first, of the first city in space has to be. And I'll tell you that that is a lot more than six people. Now, I talked about uh, exports. I talked about people earning money to be able to pay for the, the, the station. And um, so as an aside, here's a, just a summary slide of, or a summary chart showing... Uh, the entire space market as it is today is just under $300 billion. But in the inset, you see that there, people spend $20 billion a year or so today to manufacture spacecraft, to launch them, and to move them around in space. So what better place to build spacecraft than in space? And what better way to move spacecraft around in space than to use space tugs that are manufactured there and that are fueled with propellants developed from uh, materials in space. So that's what the people in the city could do to earn money to buy things from Earth. We've seen how the city could be affordable, but even if it's theoretically affordable, who would actually ever invest in it? Now, there's multiple groups, but one is that, as I just said, the city is a business, so it will have... Uh, retained earnings. It will have an ability to make money. And within the business, there is the local production and consumption. So there are local businesses inside, the electricians and the plumbers and the 
baristas and the pizza makers. So there, there will be interest from the entrepreneurial investors and also from financial investors. Beyond that, the city will more importantly be an extremely large real estate development or literally land development. And individuals and businesses will buy property with the idea that they can use it and then sell it for more than they bought it for over time so that they can retire back to earth if they want to. Nevertheless, the investment won't appeal to just any investor. Those who do invest will do it because they see the city as important. And here's its importance. Everyone on earth deserves the opportunity at a high standard of living. But to deliver this high standard of living, we will need to go beyond conservation, beyond efficiency improvements, beyond even strong ecological programs, in order to, de to deliver a high standard of living to all in the long term, we will need more material resources and energy than the earth can give us. And space has vast amounts of both. So the city is important. It is technically and financially feasible. And it is a necessary first step in the long direction. So to those of you who are radical innovators, and those of you who financially support radical innovation, now's the time to get moving. You have an opportunity to change the course of human history. And it's not often you get a chance to do that. Thank you.